authentic revival flows out of relationship. Now, I'm not talking about a casual relationship or an occasional acquaintance. Authentic revival flows out of that kind of relationship that comes from deep, personal, passionate relationship. You read in Scripture very interesting events like Abraham having dinner with the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And so Abraham, who became the father of the faithful, the father of the righteous by faith, that flowed out of occasions. We read multiple occasions where he fellowshiped with God. Even having dinner with God. And that reminds me, back in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a book that came out, a Christian book came out, and it was all centered around this gal would, would get up in the morning and she would pour two cups of coffee. She would sit down at her cup and the other cup was for Jesus. And she said, but Jesus always talked so much, he never did drink his. <laughs> Moses fellowshiped with God. And in the scripture says he would talk with God face to face as a man would talk with his friends. So Chris, it'd be like you and I going to Starbucks and having coffee together. And he would fellowship with God that way face to face. And sometimes it would last 40 days with God. And then he would come back to the people and he would be glowing with the glory of Almighty God out of his fellowship with God. King David won his greatest victories when he would go and spend time with God. He had a favorite place he would go and spend time with God. It was called the Cave of Adullam. And when he would go and spend time with God there, God would give him secrets about the enemy and then give him battle strategies so he always was victorious over his enemy. But it came out of his fellowshipping with God. The Lord Jesus Christ began his public ministry in a very interesting way. He went and spent 40 days with God in the wilderness. Now, he also faced the enemy and was victorious over the enemy. And then from the 40 days in the wilderness, fellowshipping with God, he went to the Jordan River, was baptized by John the Baptist, and was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then he began his public ministry. His power of his public ministry flowed out of his fellowship with God. And there would be times like one occasion in Galilee, he ministered all day long and all night long. And then he went alone in the wilderness and spent time fellowshipping with God before he went back to personal ministry. His ministry flowed out of his personal relationship with Heavenly Father. How was the church born? The church was born by 120 people spending 10 straight days worshiping and praising God and on the tenth day, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and power. And out of that, the church began its ministry. The church was born. And then when it came under persecution, they came back together again and spent a lengthy time waiting on God again and were baptized afresh in the Holy Spirit and then continued its ministry. And when the gospel 
and the, and the church went to the Gentiles for the first time. Up to that time, it was only Jewish. When it went to the Gentiles, that came out of Peter spending a lengthy time with Almighty God, catching a vision from God, and then being called to go to the home of a Gentile who filled his house with people. And as Peter preached, they were born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the church was birthed among the Gentiles. Flowing out of fellowship with Almighty God. Now, just a casual reading of church history will reveal that every great revival that has happened down through history in the church, every great authentic revival flowed out of deep, personal, and passionate relationship with Almighty God. When an individual or a community of individuals began to seek deep, personal, passionate relationship, revival was birthed each time. It flows out of relationship. Well, let's look and see what Scripture says about it, shall we? Let's go to Psalm 25, the first one. Psalm 25, 1 to 5. Again, this is King David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Almighty God will call us into seasons of waiting on Him so that we are not walking in shame. There are believers that walk in condemnation. They walk in shame over their past life. But Almighty God says the way to be victorious over condemnation and shame is to learn how to spend seasons with Almighty God so that you're fellowshipping with God. Because the more you fellowship with God, the more you know God's affirmation and God's assurance in your life. And Almighty God wants to give you His assurance, His affirmation. Ephesians chapter 1, it says that in love, He has predestined us to be adopted as children because we are made accepted in the Beloved. And so the more we fellowship with Him, the more we have that affirmation and that assurance in our life that we can walk free from condemnation and shame in the past. Amen? Amen. Excuse me. Not only that, He says through that, through that waiting on Him, we gain the power and strength to always be victorious over our enemies. Why? Because through that fellowship with Him, that waiting on Him, we are strengthened with His might in the inner person. His strength in us empowers us. The other thing He said is when we wait on Him, that we learn His ways. We learn His ways. Have you figured out yet that the way you come up with first comes out of your natural man, your natural woman, and it's usually the wrong way. How many have figured that out? Ten of you. The rest of you, you've got a great revelation coming. But here's what's amazing. The more you wait on Him, the more you spend time fellowshipping with Him, the more you will begin to quickly go to His way and then 
pretty soon, more often than not, you will, you will come to His way first. And when you do it His way, it's always the victorious way. It's always the best way. It's always the most bountiful and fruitful way. Amen? Then He said this, not only, not only will we learn His ways, but we'll learn His paths. Now, why is that important? Let me illustrate it for you this way. Before you came to Jesus, you had developed paths that offended you. <clears throat> you got hurt, you got wounded, you got offended, you responded in a certain way. You got hurt, you got wounded, you responded in a certain way. You got hurt, you got wounded, you responded in a certain way. Has anybody besides me noticed life, human life, there, it's not fair out there. And there's always somebody that wants to step on you, somebody that wants to offend you, somebody that doesn't like you. I mean, maybe they don't like the way you wear your hair. Of course, I got over that problem a while ago. They, you know, there's things that they, they don't, they just don't like you. And usually it's stuff that you can't change. But they don't like you. They, and, and they offend you. They hurt you. And, and usually it's someone that hurts you the most is the person that's closest to you. But you respond and you build these paths in your life. The problem is they are paths that have come out of the carnal man, the carnal woman. They're paths that you've developed in your life that respond to situations. And you are now responding out of these default these default in you, you just default to those paths. But when you come to Jesus Christ, He wants to get you off of that path because that's the wide path that leads to destruction. He wants to get you on the narrow path that leads to life. And the only way you're going to get off the wide path to the narrow path is you've got a fellowship with Him enough that you can let Him teach you and lead you how to walk in those narrow paths so that you are changing the path of your life and the defaults in your life. And now Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God becomes the default in your life and that becomes the path because you're walking in His ways. That only comes from fellowshipping with Him. Waiting. And that's why David I wait on you all the day long. Amen. Amen. Can I tell you something? This is, this, this is extra. I'm not charging you. Shut the radio off. Get the talking heads off. And start fellowshipping with God. You'll get a better path. Come on. Amen. amen. Woo. Let's go to another one. <laughs> Let's go to Luke twenty four forty nine. This is an interesting one. It just simply says this. And we're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Now, let me give you the context. The context is Jesus Christ has had his final conversation with his disciples. He's gone back to heaven. And they are going to the temple every day and worshiping and praising God. And what happens? They're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because look, this is this is what this is what Jesus said to them. He said, You don't go do anything until you're clothed with power from on high. Acts 1, 4 to 5 records it this way. Acts 1, 4 to 5 records it this way. It says this. It says in, in the Luke scripture, it says, But tarry in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father which saith he, you've heard of me. For John, and then in Acts, it says, Wait. Wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. John truly baptized with water, but you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Those two scriptures tie together because Luke and Acts were both written by the same author. Luke, Dr. Luke. And they are companion volumes. Luke is volume one, Acts is volume two. And those first few verses 
of Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, or through 5 rather, is just picking up where the Gospel of Luke left off. And God is saying this to you and I. I am calling you to wait on me because I want to give you a supernatural power in your life. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Almighty God is wanting to make you a resource of supernatural power wherever you live, wherever you work. When you walk in, you can become a source of supernatural power. By the very fact that you're there, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are fellowshipping with Almighty God, you are a source of supernatural power. They need a miracle. They've got someone there that has miracle power. They need healing. They have someone there that has healing power. They need God to intervene and make the impossible happen. You are there. You are there. You're that source. But when we walk with God casually, and then somebody needs a miracle, we have to go and fast and pray for three days so we can be ready to bring them that miracle. Hey, don't walk it that way. Yeah, you can walk it that way. Don't walk it that way. Fellowship with God on a regular basis. Learn how to wait on God on a regular basis. And you are a walking dynamo and source of power wherever you go. Whatever you're doing, you are on go every moment of the day. Because you're fellowshipping with God and you're walking in that supernatural power. Amen? Amen. Peter and John are on their way. They've, They've been somewhere on the Mount of Olives, apparently. And they're coming back to the city of Jerusalem. They're coming through the eastern gate, the beautiful gate. And there's this guy there begging. And they had forgot to stop by the cash machine on their way into town. And the guy goes, and he, and he goes you know, we don't have any money. But listen, what we do have, we'll give to you. Do you hear that? What we do have, we'll give to you. See, they were walking dynamo. So what did they do? In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Boom, he got his miracle. They didn't have to go, good idea, we want to pray for you. Let's go spend three days fasting and praying, we'll come back and pray for you. No, no, they were a walking dynamo. They had already been fellowshipping with God. They knew what to do, and they knew they could do it. What we do have, we will give to you. I want to ask you a question. What do you have to give at your workplace? Besides your skill and your task that you do for your employer, what else do you bring to the, to the, to the table? What do you have when you go to Safeway? Well, I'm just going there to get some butter. How about being ready to touch somebody for Jesus Christ while you're there? How about stopping the entire checkout line while you do a miracle for someone? But you see, this doesn't just happen. See, we we live in such an instant society. Instant cash machine. Drive up windows. Pre-made meals. Subways. I mean, just we, we we're we're such an instant community and and that, that's how our culture is. Isn't it interesting? we got all these time-saving devices and nobody has time. It's kind of like, it's kind of like gals that catch all the sales and they're so busy saving money at the sales that their checkbook is empty. What are we saving time for? It's always, it, or it's always to try and, well, down the road, well, down the road, well, well, down the road, well, down, uh, down the road. 
Well, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do a vacation. And then we come back from vacation and we're so emotionally and physically spent from vacation, we need time to rest. The reason is because we have not learned how to put margin into our life. Do you realize that's why God gave us the day of rest? The seventh day? was to put margin in our life so that there would be days that we could reflect, that we could renew. That we could restore. That we would have time for meditation. That we would have time with one another. And so he gave us the seventh day, the day of rest. But we don't do that anymore. We just, man, we pack it seven days. And we just go. And it's the same way, it's the same way we want we want it to be spiritual. And 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 that's how and that's how we're doing church. Fifty five minutes, sixty minutes, because we've got service on top of service on top of service on top of service. And I want to tell you, that doesn't work well. That's one of the reasons we stopped having double morning services. Because they were packed and we were having to hurry through the services. And we didn't, listen, we didn't have time to wait on God. It takes time. It takes time. Revival does not come in an instant. You cannot, you cannot invite in some sort of a special speaker, have them come in, open up their suitcase, and boom, you get revival. It does not work that way. You might have some good meetings. You might hear some great teaching. You might even have some great music. But that does not mean revival. Great music and great teaching does not mean revival. Revival is when the presence of God is so strong and so great. He is saturating your life and things are changing. And it changes from being carnality to becoming a spirit-driven life. A Holy Spirit-motivated life. A Holy Spirit-guided and directed life. A Holy Spirit-empowered life. A Holy Spirit life that reflects the righteousness and the glory of Almighty God. That's revival. Sin leaves righteousness is exalted. Mm. Wowzer. Let's look at some ways that that happened. And I'm going to ask the team to come up, would you please? Mm-hmm. So what is it? Waiting on God. It's interesting. Because it's the same Hebrew word in all these places, including Isaiah, that we're going to get to next week. It's the same Hebrew word. And it means to braid, twist, or bind. It means to make a rope that is strong and secure. Okay? So, you can have a string that holds a kite, right? But what that string, you 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 don't want to go in to your wife's sewing cabinet and get out a spool of her sewing thread And tie that on your kite. Right? But when you look at the string that you hold your kite with, you will notice it's made up of that kind of thread woven together. Several, several strands of that kind of thread woven together that makes the string that holds your kite. 
Now watch this. So do you want a kite string holding the calf you're trying to get down and brand? I don't think that you want a kite string going from your saddle horn to the calf. I don't think that's what you want because that calf's gone. Right? But when you look at this rope that will hold that calf, it is made up of several strands of kite kind of string woven together that makes that rope strong enough that it will hold that calf while you throw it and then tie its legs and brand it. Right? But I got a question for you. Do you want a calf rope to dock a ship? I don't think so. Because have a pretty good wave come in and that rope's going to snap, right? With that ship. But on the other hand, this is the kind of rope that will hold that ship. Go to the next slide. There you go. But look what, look what that rope is made out of. It's made up of several strands of that kind of rope that maybe you would use for a calf. And the, and the braiding of that rope makes it strong enough. It'll hold that ship. And that's how waiting is on God. Go to the next slide. Right there. That's waiting on God. It's taking your life and weaving it with God. That's waiting on the Lord. That's fellowshipping with God. Now look with me at Psalm 27. Go to the next. Would you read this with me out loud, everyone together? One thing have I asked from the Lord. That will I seek after. For me to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to see the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in His temple, for in the time of trouble He will hide me in His pavilion, in the shelter of the tabernacle, He will hide me. Waiting on God requires a passionate desire. It doesn't happen casually. It doesn't happen casually. It's a passionate desire. You've got to want to be there. Man, I'll tell you. December 9th, 1968, I had my first date with this little Italian girl in Great Falls, Montana. For the next 90 straight days. I got off duty at 5 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, I was at 2209 First Avenue North. I'll never forget it. One thirty one morning, her dad got off work. He worked a swing shift. Her dad got off work. He came in and looked at me and said, Don't you think it's time you went home? I went home. Al became like a dad to me. Taught me fishing, taught me hunting. He was the consummate Montana man. I had to make it permanent. This thing of her living at 2209 First Avenue North and me being at Barracks 768 of the 341st Combat Support Group, that doesn't work in so November 1969 I asked her the big question and she said yeah <laughs> 49 years we've been living in the same house and I hope I can do it another 49 how much do you want God It takes passion and it takes focus. 
It's, it's amazing to me, this generation of kids, how you can't get them to focus on anything unless you put a computer game in their hand, and now they're focused. They got it going. They want to win that game. They are focused, and they're going to play that game until they learn how to win that game. They're focused. An athlete, an athlete that, 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 that wants to be the best they can be, and, and, and they're, they're at team breakfast, they're at all the practices, they're working out on their own. They, they're focused. They want to win it. They're focused. Folks, we got to get focused. As, as, the, as the church of Almighty God, we have got to get focused. And we've got to learn how to fellowship with Him and passionately go after Him. Look at the next one. This is the scripture we looked at a moment ago in Luke 24. Would you, let me get my pointer out. Would you read it with me, everyone, together? And we are continually in the temple praising and blessing God. We not only have to passionately and become focused so that we go after it, we have got to commit ourselves, I am not going to stop. I'm going after it. I'm not going to stop. I'm going after it. But that means we've got to work past the boredom. We've got to work past I mean, I have people go, how come we sing the same thing? I mean, boy, by the time we sing that the third time, I am bored to death. Stop. That's because you're not thinking about what you're saying. You're just saying words. You're just standing there looking at the screen. You've got to move yourself past that, and you've got to start thinking about what those words mean and what they mean for you in your relationship with Heavenly Father. You've got to move past the boredom. You've got to move past letting your mind wander. And you've got to grab your thoughts and bring them captive. You can't let your mind wander. You've got to grab them and bring them captive. So that you're thinking about God. Trust me, when I was with Wanda, I didn't let my mind wander. I was studying her face. Her hair, her lips, her eyes. I wanted to be with her. I was thinking about her. I was listening to her words. I wanted to get, and I would sing her songs. It was back in the days of Bobby Benton and the Beatles, and I would sing her songs. I know, that was back in the dark ages. Can I tell you, it means everything in the world to me. When like what happened this morning, when I woke immediately, it's a little after five, and come spend time with me. I'm waiting for you. Come spend time with me. I'm waiting for you. And just the thought that Almighty God, my Heavenly Father, my Papa, wanted time with me. He wants time with you. Look at the next scripture. Would you read it with me? To you I lift my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, and as the eyes of a maiden to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look upon the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Pastor Reagan and I have this really fun thing. It's like we have the same Papa. And what he says to him, me, what he says to me, he says to him. I mean, it's just like nonstop. It's continual. He'll be, he'll be telling me what he's taught at the men's class on Saturday morning. And I'm going, are you kidding me? Let me tell you what he's been saying to me. And it's just so fun. This morning he comes in and says, I gotta tell you what happened. I was up a little after five. <laughs> and uh, went out to turn the water on, the grass. And my dog was with me. He's got this crazy dog. He says, I heading back in the house. I started to open the door. And I looked down, and the dog was sitting there, just sitting there, really nice, really calm, his little tail going. It's not a little tail. It's like a whip. There's a little tail going. 
He said he was so calm and those big brown eyes looking up at me with adoration. I'm his master. I'm his master. And I said, oh, Pastor Reagan, Psalm 123. As the eyes of a servant look to their master, so our eyes look to the Lord, our God. Do you? Do you? Would you stand with me, please? Let's just spend some season worshiping Him. Waiting on God. This is waiting on God. It is, it is a human being braiding their soul and spirit with the Spirit of God. It's braiding your soul and spirit with the Spirit of God so that His strength becomes your strength. His thoughts become your thoughts. His ways become your ways. It's braiding your life with him.